before, before coming up to this mount, Jesus is taking his disciples, according to the Gospel of Matthew and to the Gospel of Luke. Before this, Jesus is taking them all the way up north. All the way up north to a place called Caesarea Philippi or Caesarea Philippi or Caesarea Philippus. And there he is asking him, well, what do people think about him? Some saying one of the prophets, some saying Elijah, some saying like that. So he says, but what do you think? And Peter is standing and he's saying, you are Christ the Lord. And he's calling Peter, Simon, you are Peter. Changing your name and you are going to build the church. Six days later, six days later, Jesus is taking them to a high mount. And when we got in here, when they got here, he was transfigured. As we can see up there. And Elijah and Moses were standing next to him. And he's showing them who he is. They were terrified. They couldn't believe. They put their head down there because they saw Elijah and they saw Moses. Jesus showing them his power that even Moses, who God told him that you are going to view the promised land, but you are not going to enter the promised land, and Jesus is bringing him to the promised land, to this place. And he's bringing Elijah, who was taken up alive to heaven, he's bringing him back to this land. So Jesus showing his power while he doing this. And uh, then the disciples were like astonished what is going on. Then Peter, who must say something always, must be the first to say something. He said, if you wish, I can build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Then the cloud came and made a big tabernacle for all of them. And the sound came, this is my beloved son. We all know the story, right? And on this spot in here, on this spot in here, already at the fourth century, <clears throat> At the 4th century, a, a Byzantine church was built there, was built in here, and there are some ruins of that church. And then a Crusades church was built at the 12th century, and then we have this modern church in here. And this modern church is based on the, is based on the ruins or on the foundations of that church. When you look at the front of the building, you see the ancient walls, and then you see this modern building. And the architect in here wanted to tell the story through the building. Jesus was shining, okay? He was shining, so we can see the shining windows. Look at the shining windows in here, and up. The shining windows made of alabaster from Egypt, the famous alabaster, that when you light it, it's shining. So this is the first thing to see that something, evidence of what happened in here. Then, one tabernacle for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. We have the main altar dedicated to the transfiguration and to Jesus Christ. That we will explain later what we see in that altar. We have one chapel. Everybody can go and visit after we finish the explanation. One chapel dedicated to Elijah. And one chapel dedicated to Moses there. Small chapels. Three chapels are dedicated to them. Okay, so this is the church from the 20th of the last century. So we can see the modern church. And again, around when you were walking, you saw the ruins. Some of the ruins are crusaders, some of the Byzantines, the Byzantine period, and other periods and other different things that were built in here. And when we look at the windows down there, we can see the triangle of the Trinity and the chalice. You can see the chalice down there. And we have two pickups. And we see a lot of peacocks usually in the churches. In a lot of churches where we go, we see peacocks. What are the peacocks? What is it symbolizing? They, usually we see double, twice, two peacocks and males, not females, because they are actually symbolizing the eternal life. How does it work? When the peacock is stretching its uh, wing, okay, it actually has circle. Two peacocks are creating one circle that has no beginning and has no end. It is eternal. The circle is eternal. It has no beginning, it has no end, and the peacock is symbolizing the eternal life. No, and every year, Tawus, peacock with Tawus. And every year, in the 8th of September, and the 6th of, uh, of August, which is the day of the Transfiguration, 
people are coming and gathering here and they are waiting from outside and inside to see the light, the first light of the sun in the horizon there behind the church coming in the window between the two peacocks. The first light, the first red light of the sun exactly there and this is the speciality of this building that actually the direction is east and west and showing us the sun going up there and when the sun goes up there it's lighting the windows and giving us an impression of the transfiguration of the thing is becoming shining more and more. And when you look at the, at the altar itself, at the altar itself, the, the part of the altar inside, which is standing here later on, you are going to see Jesus actually in four steps in his life, a baby in the manger, Jesus with the It's actually mosaics, and there we can see the transfiguration and more decoration in this church, especially the Franciscan cross that we see it everywhere. Now there's a discussion in between different denominations, agreeing or not agreeing about this place. Is it the right place or not? The gospel doesn't tell us the place. There are some groups of people who believe that this is Mount Hermon up north. And again, as Father said from the first day, it doesn't matter. It could be here, could be there. What we are interested in is the transfiguration itself. And not and something it, it's else. Somewhere here. Exactly, somewhere here. Beside that, while Jesus was wandering here in this area, there's a village not far from us down there in that valley, in the plain, the Jezreel Valley, on the plain of Armageddon. That church is called Naim. And that valley was well known with its battles, and a lot of people were that would that died there. And in that specific village, that after you finish, you can go outside, turn left, go up to the roof. A side roof of the church you look down there there's a single village that in that village a famous miracle happened when jesus getting into the village of naim and he found a funeral and he asked what's going on and they said that it was a widow who lost her single son and jesus had pity on the widow not on the son on the widow especially because it's a patriarchal society in here as it is today it was two thousand years ago women actually have a tough life in here if they have no man next to them and at that time jesus is doing that miracle and everybody was talking about that this happened not far in timing of the transfiguration so jesus was wandering in this area you notice it's only half an hour driving from from uh, nazareth so we have mount Tabor, we have mm -hmm. and we have nazareth so uh, in bethlehem we've been at the place where he was just a baby a little little baby okay we will go to nazareth later on to see to see jesus as a child playing in the street causing his parents troubles problems disappearing for them they're looking for him and he doesn't care about them Sorry. <laughs> What does this mean? He doesn't care. When they came to him at the temple and his mother is talking to him, he's like, he doesn't know what is the pain of the parents when they lose their kids. Doesn't know? He knows everything. <laughs> he pretends he doesn't know. I don't want to get in there. <laughs> no, no, what is the what the name? They fell asleep. I didn't say they were down. They fell asleep. <laughs> and tomorrow we will see Jesus in his ministry, performing all the miracles, and here we see Jesus as God. He's showing them that he is the real God. He is the real Messiah. This is the purpose of Mount Tabor, and this is the major thing of the transfiguration. And of course, Abuna will tell us more and more about that. I hope you agree with me, Abuna, okay? Okay, so this is a little bit about, about this Mount Tabor, this place, the elevation in here, geography. The elevation in here is about uh, uh, 
1,800 feet above sea level, 600 meters 